Hello, I'm Dr. Kathleen Pace Murphy, Assistant Professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center Medical School, Division of Geriatric and Palliative Medicine. Welcome to the Houston Geriatric Education Center's module on complications of hospitalization in older adults. This program, the Houston Geriatric Education Center's Baby Boomer Modules Online, has been funded by a grant from the Health Resource and Service Administration, or HRSA, of the Department of Health and Human Services. This grant was initially funded in 2007 with a renewal for funding for five years beginning in 2010. Our grant number was UB4HP19058. The objectives for today are to identify risks that contribute to complications associated with older adult hospitalization. We're going to describe common complications of hospitalization in older adults and discuss interventions to prevent common complications associated with hospitalization among older adults. Why are we doing this module? Well, persons age 65 and older make up 13% of the population and account for 36% of acute care hospital admissions and nearly half of the hospital expenditures for all adults. The graying of America will impact acute hospital care as the proportion of older adults continue to age, especially the fastest growing cohort, those 85 years and older. There are a lot of benefits in hospitalizations. It addresses serious medical problems. People in the hospital have vascular obstructions that are repaired. We take care of broken bones and other urgent surgical issues, heal infections, and utilize advanced biomedical technologies to cure and alleviate life-threatening conditions. But hospitals can also be a very dangerous place. Hospitals are a major risk factor for older adults. It increases the risk for deteriorating functional status. We know that the risk of older adults developing a new activity of daily living disability during a hospitalization has been estimated to be at least 30%. Approximately 50% of older adult disabilities develop during a person's hospitalization. Often there are increased risks for adverse drug reactions when people are hospitalized. It increases your risk for delirium, and in older adults it also increases the risk for poor outcomes, especially in frail elders who have limited functional reserves. They seem to fare far worse than younger cohorts, and it leads to longer lengths of stay, higher cost, and higher rates of institutionalization at discharge. A proactive and preventable plan of care can help prevent many complications of hospitalization. I'd like to review with you four general geriatric principles before we get into our main discussion. Those principles are physiologic heterogeneity, functional reserves, multiple morbidity, and immobility. Physiological heterogeneity is a common principle in geriatric medicine. As one ages over the age of 65, the one-size-fits-all concept is no longer applicable. People are very, very different based on their chronological age. And as we take care of adults, older adults, in hospitals, we know that biological age, or the age of a person's body, is a much more important concept than that of their chronological age. Chronological age versus biological age means how long you have lived and how old is your body. Chronological age, for as an example, can be two people that are the age of 75. One very active, one very frail. The number really does not give you 
any good information. But biological age is how old your body is, how well your organs are functioning. And as one ages over the age of 65, we look at the biological age, the functionality of an older person, and that is how we treat the person and take care of the person based on that concept. Let's look at some characteristics of aging. None of us are getting out of here alive. We know that mortality increases exponentially as one ages. There are many biochemical composition changes in the tissue. Physiological capacity decreases. Our ability to maintain homeostasis diminishes. And we're more susceptible and vulnerable to disease as our age increases. On top of that, multiple medical conditions or multiple comorbidities provide added physiological stress to the aging body. We talked about functional reserve in our introduction to the baby boomer imperative, but I think it's very important that we talk about it again in maybe a different context. When you look at this graph, a couple things to look at. On the x-axis, you see increasing age. And then you see both striped physiological reserves already in use, and then what we have available physiological reserves available, and then a line that states the precipice. If you look to the left of the graph, you will see in younger age that for day-to-day -day activities, you use a very small amount of physiological reserves. And if, for example, your two-year-old was to get an ear infection, they could go above that line into the physical reserves available and have a great amount of reserves that are available to help the child fight off an infection. But as we age, that whole striped area of physiological reserves already in use, we have to use more and more of our physiological reserves in our daily activities of living. And as you go from left to right, you see as people get older, they have to use more and more of that physiological reserve and have less and less of physiological reserves available for them if they get sick. And because of that, oftentimes older adults will get sicker faster because they reach the precipice much faster. Healthy adults convert into frail older persons with diminished reserves in most physiological systems and that increases their vulnerability to disease and to death. This concept has also been known as something called homeostenosis. Diminished homeostatic reserves is probably one of the most um, important and major characteristics of aging. The reduced capacity to address to stressors increases the susceptibility of older persons to a variety of illnesses. As we move forward talking about complications of hospitalization, we would like to also make sure that we present different components that are important for you to teach your patients. The first thing that we like to tell our older adults, especially those going in for elective surgery, is to move, get ready, train like you are training for a marathon for your elective surgery. Why is movement and exercise so important? The research shows it decreases falls. It improves glucose homeostasis. It improves cardiovascular function. It helps with flexibility. People sleep better when they exercise. From research we know that exercise and increased movement help decrease depression and serve as a protective mechanism with depression and dementia. It also provides less hip and knee pain due to arthritis. Who is particularly vulnerable to adverse events? Well, as we mentioned, in geriatric medicine, it's not the age that matters, it's your function and your physiological status. But we do know as people age, oftentimes they become more frail, and increasing age is one of the indicators or variables that we see. Low baseline functional status. People who are admitted to the hospital and already have some dependency issues as it relates to their activities of daily living. Cognitive impairment. 
Cognitive impairment is grossly underdiagnosed. So people that are coming into our acute care hospitals who do not have a diagnosis of cognitive impairment, who become more confused, who do not understand discharge orders or discharge education, all of these make them more vulnerable. People who have multiple chronic illnesses or comorbidities, depression, malnutrition as defined as low albumin levels, polypharmacy, multiple medications, not only prescribed by a healthcare provider, but over-the-counter and also homeopathic medications. And then sensory deficits, and specifically visual and auditory deficits. As I mentioned before, dementia is a predisposing factor for complications. We know that dementia, mild cognitive impairment, its prevalence increases with age. The most common causes of dementia are Alzheimer's disease followed by vascular dementia. A predisposing factor, especially for people with dementia, is delirium in the hospitalized elderly. Patients with dementia who develop delirium during their hospital stay have not only an increased length of hospitalization, but they also have higher risks of post-acute institutionalization and a high mortality rate. That's why comprehensive evaluation of older adults is important. Determining a baseline health status is essential in assessing risk for hospital adverse events. Well, what kinds of things do you do in a comprehensive evaluation? Well, first, let's think about this. We know that people age differently. We've talked about genetic factors, the multiple chronic illnesses, but there's also lifestyle changes that need to be evaluated. For example, smoking, or how about alcohol? We know right now that one in five adults have substance abuse conditions or a mental health disorder. Specifically, in the baby boomer cohort, we know that older adults with substance abuse disorders are currently at 4.8 million. This number is projected to double in six years in 2020. Being able to assess preoperatively or in the acute care hospital about issues such as alcohol can prevent many post-operative complications. There's also environmental factors. Poverty, adherence to plans of care, is the person malnourished? And of course, their physical function. What are they able to do? Or what about their social function? Who's going to care for these people once they're discharged? Do they live alone? Do they live in multi-storied homes where they're not going to be able to get up to a bathroom or to their bedroom? So evaluating the person from a functional status, a social status, a psychological status, as well as a physiological status is critically important to both a successful hospitalization and a successful discharge. For our interprofessional healthcare audience, I like to make sure that you recognize there are two red flags. And this occurs both in an outpatient and an inpatient setting. And those two red flags are delirium and falls. We consider delirium a medical emergency. And falls are a sign that something is not right medically. And if you can remember these two red flags, it will help you as you care for older adults over the age of 65. So let's talk a little bit about delirium. Delirium is frequently underdiagnosed. We know that 8 to 30 percent of hospitalized older adults have delirium when they're admitted into the hospital on an acute basis. Delirium is a direct predictor of increased length of hospital stay, increased rates of in-hospital death, and also an increase in nursing home placement. There's some clinical features that are important to recognize. It's an acute decline in attention and global cognitive functioning. There are three types of delirium, hypoactive delirium, hyperactive delirium, and mixed delirium. Hypoactive delirium is what it suggests. The person becomes sleepy. The person is hard to arouse. The person cannot attend to you because they keep falling asleep. Hyperactive delirium, 
the person is hyperactive, possibly pulling out their IV lines, taking off their oxygen, very, very restless in the hospital. Or the mixed delirium is where the patient fluctuates between that of sleepiness and agitation. The incidence of delirium varies based on the type of acute care population that is studied, but incidence as high as 50% for certain subsets of the population have been documented in the research. This is a wonderful acronym that we use that was actually put together by Francis Martin and Kapoor out of the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1990. And what it does is it spells out in red delirium. And these are possible triggers that may be the etiology or cause, if you will, of the delirium. For example, D, drug use. Think about hypnotics and especially high anticholinergic burden drugs. E, electrolyte abnormalities. L, the lack of drugs. Withdrawal from drugs, withdrawal from alcohol should always be considered in delirium. I stands for infection. We always look at urinary tract infections and lower respiratory infections such as a pneumonia. R is reduced sensory input and specifically look at visual impairment and auditory impairment in a person that may be having a delirium episode. I represents intracranial problems such as stroke. U urinary retention and fecal impaction. And lastly, M, myocardial or metabolic problems, such as a low blood sugar, high blood sugar, low thyroid problem, high thyroid problem. All of these can be triggers for delirium in your patient in the hospital. There are many drugs that may cause delirium. You can see the long list here on your slides. The number of drugs prescribed to hospitalized patients is directly proportional to their age. Hospitalization is a period of rapid turnover in drug therapies for older adults. 40% of drugs prescribed before admission were discontinued during a patient's hospitalization, and over 45% of drugs prescribed at discharge were started during hospitalization. We know that 88% of older adults that are hospitalized were found to have at least one or more clinically significant drug problems. Well, what do I mean by significant drug problems? Inappropriate medications prescribed, adverse side effects, or drug-drug interactions. And 22% of hospitalized older adults have at least one potentially serious and life-threatening problem. Delirium management is very important. Prudent measures to prevent or ameliorate delirium include identifying and treating underlying medical causes such as infection or metabolic abnormalities. Avoid sleep deprivation. Proper nutrition and hydration. Avoid excessive bed rest, room changes, and restraints, both physical or environmental. Restraints can be anything from oxygen tubing, IV tubing, Foley catheters to too much furniture in the environment that can cause and restrict the patient from movement. We want to avoid medications associated with delirium whenever possible, especially moderate to high anticholinergic drugs. We want to utilize family, friends, or sitters to help provide frequent orientation to the person that is experiencing delirium. Make sure you put on their hearing aids give them their glasses, provide pictures of family members so that it becomes more familiar to them. Open up the blinds and the windows and make sure that patients know the difference between day and night. Research has shown that 33% of cases of delirium can be prevented by appropriately managing six risk factors for delirium. Number one, cognitive impairment. Underlying cognitive impairment consistent with dementia is present on admission of up to 20 to 40 percent of hospitalized older adults, and it's undiagnosed. This needs to be addressed. By recognizing a patient has a cognitive impairment, frequent orientation 
working closely with their social support network can help prevent delirium in an acute hospitalization. Sleep deprivation. Have patients avoid daytime napping. As mentioned previously, open the shades of the window to let sunlight in. Distinguish between day and night. Limit the number of interruptions during the night, if possible, to allow the person to have uninterrupted sleep. Immobility. As one of our very first slides of this module showed, you have to move. Move, move, move. As soon as the patient has the opportunity to get out of bed, we need to get them into sitting in a chair, standing, and walking to the bathroom and walking the floors. It is one of the most important interventions that we can make for these patients. It will help maintain their functional abilities and prevent many types of problems that come with immobility, such as pneumonia, pressure ulcers, etc. Visual impairment, make sure they're wearing their glasses. Hearing impairment, make sure they have not only their hearing aids in, but if needed, some kind of device that might help them in the hospital room to hear better. And then dehydration. Watch what you drink. One of the things that we have taught our older patients that seems to be helpful, as well as their children or caregivers, is to monitor their urine output, but not the amount as much as the color. We tell our patients that your urine should look more like lemonade than iced tea. And if it's looking like iced tea, that they're most likely dehydrated. And by hydrating and getting it to a lemonade color, they can prevent many of the uh, sequelae that can occur with dehydration in a hospital setting. Let's examine musculoskeletal changes with aging. As one ages and not exercising, we can see several different things that happen. A reduction in muscle mass and strength, a decrease in aerobic capacity, physiological changes in the cartilage structure and function, a decrease in the flexibility of the tendons, and we know as we age there can be a decrease in bone density, especially in women. Immobility is not the friend of the elderly. For older adults, 10 days of bed rest results in a similar loss of muscle mass as a decade of normal aging. I often emphasize this statistic because I find it so startling. Think about it, you're 75 years old and you go into the acute care hospital and you end up in bed for 10 days and you come out with the muscles of an 85 year old. It's really, really important that patients understand, families understand, and our interprofessional healthcare providers understand that getting patients up and out of bed is a critically important step and then returning to functional status. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, think about it. Greater than 30% of hospitalized elderly over the age of 70 have a hospital loss of at least one activity of daily living. The ability to walk briskly and the habit of walking one mile or more daily are associated with prolonged survival. Immobility due to hospitalization leads to rapid deconditioning and subsequent difficulty in walking. Well, what do we do with those people that lose that functioning? They have to go home and live by themselves, and their children are relocated out of the city and are living all over the country. If we keep patients moving no matter what, we can keep them in their home longer and have them age in place. So let's talk a little bit about falls. Patients who fall in the hospital stay 12 days longer than counterparts who do not fall. We know that there's an increased prevalence in patients who have cognitive deficits, delirium, frailty, multiple medical devices, sensory deficits, and also a history of falls. Frailty, let me just define that, is people that have unintentional weight loss, they feel exhausted, they're weak, they have slow walking speed, and they are low physical activity. Sternberg and Swartz in 2011 did a review of frailty in the Journal of American Geriatric Society, and they stated in people over the age of 85, approximately 70% of them show signs of frailty. 
So being able to recognize some of these syndromes such as delirium and frailty can help us recognize very quickly those patients who are at increased risk for falls. What can be done about falls? Well, falls, in my opinion, is one of the most important questions that you have to ask a patient when they're admitted to the hospital. Ask, have you fallen before? Or say, how many times have you fallen in the last amount of time? Having an idea of whether or not a patient is a previous faller is critically important because if they've fallen before, they're at a fall risk now. You want to assess the patient's gait, their balance, lower extremity strength, their ability to get up from the bed or the chair in their hospital room. What is their state of cognition? How about their mood? There's many tests that can be done to assess different gait, balance, and lower extremity strength. And one of the easiest to do is the get up and go test. It tells you a tremendous amount of information. Have the patient sit in a chair and ask them to try to get up from the chair without assistance or using the arms of the chair and walk the distance in the hospital room, turn around, walk back to the chair and sit down. Oftentimes what you will see can give you a great deal of information about the person's ability to successfully ambulate without help. Can the person get out of their chair without hoisting themselves up with their arms? Does the patient rock back and forth and try to propel themselves out of the chair? How is their quadriceps strength when they try to stand up straight? Do they walk with a wide base gait or have an ataxic gait? Do they lift up their feet or do they have proprioception problems where they keep their feet close to the ground and shuffle? When they go to turn around at the doorway to walk back, do they need to hold on to the wall or the door to safely turn around because of balance problems? All these observations and assessments can give you a clue as to the whether a person is a fall risk. Let's talk a little bit about interventions. Persons that are able to walk independently should be encouraged to do so frequently during their hospitalizations. Those able to walk but unable to do it safely and independently can receive assistance from family, staff, and with a physical therapy consult. Family members always want to know what to do or how they can help in the hospital and having them help their elder walk in the halls can be one of the greatest assets the nursing staff and the interprofessional staff can have. Make sure they understand that they need to walk several times a day. In fall prevention think about things such as avoiding restraints and tethers. Do you really need that urinary catheter in? Can it come out? Is the person hydrated and needing the IV, or can we go to a HEP lock? Does the patient need the oxygen to the wall, or can we use a portable oxygen tank so that they can walk throughout the hospital? When you're providing walking assistance for those who walk with difficulty, perhaps the family might need a little bit of education to know what side to walk on with the patient to tell them that they should be in charge of holding and rolling the IV pole while the patient just walks independently and not worry about the IV. Providing an early physical therapy um, consultation is important so that weakness or gait abnormalities can be assessed, intervened, and a home program put together for successful discharge. The other thing that we often find is that especially in acute hospitalizations, it's important for people to look at older adults' feet. There might need to be a consult with a podiatrist for ingrown toenails, for um, other foot problems that have not been addressed by the elder. Look at their footwear and make sure that their footwear is appropriate for their gait and their balance and for the problems that they have. We often find times that patients who are having balance problems are wearing high heels when they come into outpatient clinics or patients are walking with non-slid stockings on throughout their acute care hospitalization. All of these things can help to reduce fall risks. Another thing that's important for fall preventions is to consider the American Geriatric Society's consensus statement which recommends that clinicians take the following key steps to ensure that patients have an adequate vitamin D supplementation in older adults. Well, 
We know that vitamin D supplementation can decrease the risk of falls by as much as 20%. And the American Geriatric Society's guidelines for fall prevention has given a strong recommendation for at least 800 international units of vitamin D3 per day in patients who are deficient or high-risk patients. Review your older patient's vitamin D intake when you assess them, and that should be from all sources, including their diet, sunlight exposure, and vitamin D supplementation or multivitamin supplementation. We want to discuss strategies to achieve a total vitamin D input of at least 4,000 international units daily. We know that this will help reduce the risk for falls or fall-related injuries. You want to discuss with older adults, especially at discharge or their caregivers if needed, how to get adequate vitamin D and calcium supplementation. The reason we add calcium supplementation was that there was insufficient data to support a recommendation for increased vitamin D supplementation without calcium for older patients. And in most cases, according to the American Geriatric Society, a calcium dose of 500 to 1,200 milligrams daily will suffice in those people. Exercise. We recommend, especially after discharge, 150 minutes of exercise per week and at least two days of resistance training. In the hospital, patients should be walking and participating in physical therapy as much as they can tolerate. Also, when in the hospital, again consider not using restraints and tethers. Tell patients that there is assistance if they walk in the halls Get your families to help if they're allowed to be ambulating. It's so important that this be known to all people, especially family and friends, because it prevents so many complications, such as constipation, reducing the chances of pneumonia, pressure ulcers, venous thromboembolisms, etc. Let's talk about functional impairment and why patients that become functionally impaired in hospitalizations is such a detriment to their successful aging. We know that once hospitalized, many older adult patients are at high risk for loss of independence and because of that, institutionalization. Hospitalized medical patients aged 70 or older experience approximately a 15-1-5 decline during hospitalization and their ability to perform basic activities of daily living. Well, if you're not familiar with activities of daily living, what are those? Some examples are toileting, grooming, eating, transportation as far as moving in and out of beds, things that they need to do to take care of themselves. Approximately 20% of older adults are discharged without recovering their baseline pre-hospitalization abilities. And approximately 15% of those admitted from home have to be discharged to a skilled nursing facility, rehabilitation, or some kind of extended nursing home facility because of the functional impairment that is experienced during their hospitalization. Functional dependence is associated with a worse quality of life outcome, a shortened survival, and increased resource use. So what do you do? What do you do about it as a person that works in an acute care hospital? It's a mantra that we're going to continue to say over and over again. Encourage early mobilization. Bed rest equals deconditioning. Deconditioning equals functional loss and functional loss equals a life-changing event for that older adult who's been admitted into your acute care hospital. Provide ambulation assistive devices as needed. Have the patient ask for help if you have IVs and hospital equipment attached and ask that it be removed from your rooms as soon as possible so that fall prevention measures can also be in place. Ask for consults with physical and occupational therapy and they will help prevent deconditioning as much as possible. And we want discharge home exercise programs and perhaps outpatient OT and physical therapy so that that patient can also continue to recover their function while they're at home. Let's talk a little bit about sensory impairment. 
Most hospitalized older adults have sensory impairments, namely visual and or hearing loss. And these sensory impairments are risk factors for falls, incontinence, delirium, and functional dependence. Eyeglasses and hearing aids often do not make it to the hospital. Family members or the older adult have a fear of losing very expensive hearing aids. Sometimes glasses and hearing aids are lost in the ambulance ride. We know visual deficits in particular have a greater effect on balance in the older adult than in a younger patient. So you want to screen on admission and ask those questions. Do you wear glasses? Do you have hearing aids? An easy way to determine if a person is having auditory problems is just do a whisper test. Whisper something in each of their ears and see if they can hear you. If they have glasses and hearing aids, have family members bring them to the hospital. If not, it's a great time for consultation with an audiologist or an ophthalmologist. If it can happen in the acute care hospital, great. If not, it should be part of the discharge plan. Let's talk about poor nutritional status. Nutritional status affects healing time, immune system function, energy levels, strength. All these things are critical to the older adult's recovery and recuperation. We know that malnutrition at baseline leads to high complication rates. And those kind of complication rates can include things such as increased mortality, longer hospital stays, and increased hospital costs. So who has a risk factor, if you will, for malnutrition? Well, that includes people that are over the age of 60, people who have poor access to food. Now, who has poor access to food? Well, people that may be socially isolated, there might be financial reasons that people are unable to afford their food. Or perhaps a person has mild cognitive impairment or dementia and no longer are able to drive. So getting to the grocery store, in fact, can be a challenge. Patients with lower educational levels have a higher risk of malnutrition. If a patient is experiencing depression, pain, perhaps overwhelming fatigue, that can affect malnutrition. Much of it in their ability to either want to cook meals for themselves or their inability to get up and to participate in preparing a meal for themselves. Many patients have swallowing problems or they've um, lost, lost the sense of taste, which affects their ability to enjoy food. Lack of teeth or ill-fitting dentures is a huge problem in the older adult. Malignancies, um, such as metastatic cancer can contribute to malnutrition and also polypharmacy and some of the adverse effects that can go with a patient being on multiple medications. So what do we do to help people prevent malnutrition and what do we do to help patients prepare to come in for elective surgery and getting them into a good nutritional state? Well some very easy things that we can do from an outpatient perspective is to find out if we can get assistance with meals. Meals on Wheels, local churches that can drop off food for older adults. Uh, we want to make sure in the hospital, for example, that patients get up out of bed into a chair to eat if it's permitted. We often look at avoiding dietary restrictions unless it's imperative to the treatment of the patients. Giving patients tasty food often helps with them eating evaluating through our speech therapy colleagues any problems that might be um, related to swallowing difficulties. Supplements um, certainly can be used between meals, but oftentimes using an interprofessional consult with a dietitian and doing a nutritional assessment is the best bet for helping our older adults not um, be malnourished. Avoiding medications that may alter taste and smell is another thing to look at. We know that there's over 250 different drugs that can alter just a person's taste related to medications. Some common medicines that can actually alter both taste or smell are things such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, diuretics like hydrochloric thiazide, chemotherapeutic medications, certain ACE inhibitors, and alcohol. Nutritional status continued just on a couple other things. Look at the amount of food that's consumed. 
Sometimes calorie counts will help. Monitoring the patient's BMI, although we like to actually use patient's waist circumference as well because it certainly helps us, especially with our patients who are overweight. Look at weight changes as they fluctuate. Nutritional consults, as we mentioned, for high-risk patients. But we add one other caveat to that. If a person is a high-risk patient because of dependency and activities of daily living, being able to have the consult with the caregiver or the family member that's helping with the nutritional preparation of the food is critically important. Not all patients can afford oral supplementation. And so if it's provided in the hospital, looking at alternatives after discharge become very, very important. And when needed and indicated, enteral feedings may help. Let's talk about depression in a hospitalized patient. Depressive symptoms in hospitalized older adults are common and prognostically very important. 33% of hospitalized older adults have depression and most of these depressions go undiagnosed or noticed. Depression is a major risk factor for hospitalized older adults. We know that when a patient in a hospital is depressed, it affects their activities of daily living and often makes them more dependent. It can actually shorten their survival, as well as change where they're going to be discharged from home. Patients that are from the hospital, when patients are depressed, oftentimes they have nursing home placement or long-term care placement. It's easy to find out if a patient is depressed. You can do older adult screening, such as the short version of the geriatric depression screen. Detection of depression is the most important step in having a patient be treated for depression. We know that there's various treatments for patients, especially older adults, for depression and it's just not pharmacomanagement. It's important for older adults to have both counseling and when necessary, pharmacotherapeutic interventions. Behavioral, cognitive, and family therapy are safe and very effective in the initial management of patients who are suspected of being depressed. Let's talk a little bit about skin and complications of hospitalization and bed rest. There are bad clinical outcomes from skin complications due to bed rest. Pain, immobility, infections of both the wound and possibly osteomyelitis, prolonged hospitalization, and often the need for rehabilitation. The first thing that you always want to do is figure out who's going to be at risk for skin complications. So let's think about some of the people we've already talked about. People who have decreased mobility. Patients who have decreased cognition or possible cognitive impairments. Patients who are incontinent of both bowel and bladder. We want to avoid things like immobilization. We want to avoid moisture over long periods of time on the skin. Pressure on one particular bony prominence or the shearing of skin when patients are being moved. Positioning of a patient who is unable to position themselves in bed becomes critically important. Activity, as we have mentioned many times in this module, has to be encouraged and use, utilization of appropriate levels of supervision or aid will help these patients reduce their chances of getting pressure ulcers. If the patient is bed bound, looking at reducing pressure through different support products is important. Cushioning bony prominences, repositioning the patient every two hours, pressure reducing mattresses, optimal nutrition and hydration. All these things are critical and key to skin health and the healing of pressure ulcers. Let's look at the pulmonary system and some of the expected changes that you'll see with aging. Hospitalized patients are susceptible to respiratory problems because of decreased mobility. Um, they're exposed to other patients who have infections. Oftentimes they're in a supine position for prolonged periods of time. Uh, they can have pain, which reduces their ability to expand their lungs. And there's multiple other reasons why older adults' pulmonary function and their chances of pulmonary complications are increased. All adults that are age 65 and older should have been asked or should be asked when they're admitted to the hospital as to whether or not they've had influenza and pneumococcal vaccinations. 
During the fall and winter months, influenza vaccinations can be administered to those who have not yet received it if they are in your hospital with an acute complication or elective surgery during that period of time. We know that patients, especially post-operatively, can have a decrease in their rib cage expansion because of pain, especially if they're in pain or have abdominal surgery or chest surgery. We know as one ages, there's a decreased lung elasticity and recoil. You can have a decrease in the alveolar surface area, a decreased hypoxic drive, decreased function in the number of cilia, an impaired cough, which will all result in a drop in their oxygen levels. So how do we prevent respiratory problems and complications in hospitalization? Well, we know some things to look for, first of all, and assess that are bad clinical outcomes in hospitals. Things such as aspiration, pneumonia. And how do we prevent it? We intervene as early as possible. We get patients up to sitting positions and standing positions. We do different maneuvers to actually expand their lungs by doing deep breathing exercises, using incentive spirometry, helping with pain control. Patients that should be on aspiration precautions if they're having cognitive impairment problems and never should eat in bed if they're allowed to get out of bed into a chair. And good old pulmonary hygiene is critical for these patients to do well and to avoid complication. We know that these older adults are prone to aspiration events that lead to pneumonia. So being able to monitor for signs of oral motor dysfunction, or weak cough, excessive throat clearing, just not eating, or when you're watching them drink liquids, they start to cough after the liquids. Assessing for that is very important and putting together a consult and making sure to identify they may be at high risk for aspiration will help the entire interprofessional team. Try to not only encourage mobility, but also avoid, if you can, psychoactive medications. Good oral care is really important. You have huge amounts of bacteria in the mouth that can increase their susceptibility to different kinds of affections. Try to avoid a lot of acid blocking medications as well in the hopes that that can also prevent any kind of infections of the lung due to aspiration. Hospital acquired infections. You want to look for urinary tract infections, especially related to indwelling catheters, bladder instrumentation. Watch for bloodstream infections, lower respiratory tract infections, as well as infected pressure ulcers and osteomyelitis. Alcohol withdrawal in the hospital can be a potentially life-threatening problem. Older adults with substance abuse disorder are projected to double by 2020. We know that 20% of persons over the age of 65 currently have either substance abuse problems or mental health problems. Research recently has shown that one out of three older adults exhibit some kind of high-risk drinking habits. People need to make sure that when we're assessing patients on intake, that they ask specifically about the amount of alcohol people are drinking. It's important for older adults to be told that they need to be honest with you, the provider. It's important in your clinical decision making. It's also important to ask about illicit drugs so that there are not drug-drug interactions or withdrawal experience during this patient's hospitalization. You know, risk factors for moderate severe alcohol withdrawal you can see things such as history of delirium tremors, concurrent illnesses, do they have a history of sustained heavy drinking, and presentations of withdrawals from alcohol specifically usually occur within 40 hours since their last drink. Polypharmacy in older adults is a problem. Many of the older adults have multiple chronic conditions that require multiple medications. But we also know that renal function is reduced as one ages. Drug-drug interactions are common, and a higher number of medications is directly, positively correlated with an increased risk of delirium. A hospital admission is an ideal time to completely review the medications a patient is taking. We know that there's many high risks involved with polypharmacies. 
medication prescription errors, drug interactions, adverse drug events during the hospitalization can all occur. We know that medication prescription errors after hospitalization also result from several different things. A failure to complete medication reconciliation, poor or complex discharge instructions that are oral instead of written down, or written instructions that are so complex patients are not able to understand them, poor patient compliance, and also complicated drug regimens with multiple medications and frequent administration times can all contribute to errors in the medications that patients take at home. Remember, we want to try to avoid acute hospitalizations in elder adults whenever possible that it's important that patients keep moving, whether they're in the hospital or out of the hospital. Support interventions that reduce potential complications in the hospital. Getting patients out of bed, making sure they're hydrated, putting on their glasses and putting in their hearing aids. Advocate for your elder with your interprofessional team. Make sure that you plan for some type of rehabilitation whether it's inpatient or at home, especially in patients who have lost functional independence in one of their activities of daily living. Remember to ask the patient many, many questions and ask their family members as well. Is this person going home by themselves? How many steps does it take to get in their house? Is their bedroom and bathroom on the second floor? Can this wheelchair that they're being discharged home to fit into their front door and fit into the bathrooms? Can the patient actually lift their leg up to get into their bathtub to take a shower? Utilize discharge planners and case managers and let's make sure that we have a safe and non-complicated discharge home so the patient does not have to return an acute hospital position again. In conclusion, many older adult patients experience adverse events during their hospitalization. Presence of adverse events increases length of hospitalization, risk of post-acute institutionalization, and in some cases, death. Many events are preventable, and you, as part of the interprofessional team, can make a huge, huge difference in these people's lives if you can recognize the early signs of complication and hospitalization. Thank you. Thank you.